So shall we start? Okay, can you hear me? Yes? Wonderful. So welcome uh, to the panel, The Arts of the Immigrant Continent, uh, organized by the Cornell Institute for European Studies as part of the, its migration series. Uh, my name is Esra Akjan. Um, this panel uh, is the last event of this academic year in the migration series that we have organized during the fall and the spring terms. The events in the series included lectures and panels such as Academic Freedom and Exile, Migration of Images, Will This Robot Take My Job, Migration Automation and Employment, Crossing the Mediterranean, Migration, Death and Culture, and now finally The Arts of the Immigrant Continent. The series will continue next year, hopefully, and we are already planning many exciting events, include, including a lecture by Etienne Balibar on September 24, uh, a sequel to Migration of Images panel, and an event to mark the anniversary of 1968 <coughs> on the Migration of Revolutionary Ideas. So stay tuned, and we do other events as well. So coming back to today's panel, um, if one were to put Europe in its global context by discussing it as a place of both arrival and departure, and if one were to write a history of migrations, one would immediately come to realize the European country's role in the history of modernization and colonization of uh, countries outside Europe. While a scholar may not have a hard time in convincing the audience of Europe's impact outside its borders, whatever those perceived borders might be, less is the case of Europe's acknowledgement as an immigrant continent. For example, despite Germans' long history uh, with the guest worker and the refugee programs, um, despite this history, immigration has hardly changed the perception of what it means to be German in conservative circles, and the immigrant has constantly been judged by a measuring stick of integration that usually expects him or her to assimilate into a predefined national identity. However, acknowledging the history of migrations would also mean acknowledging Europe as an immigrant continent and diaspora of various peoples. Uh, in this vein, today's panel will concentrate on the relation between immigration and art, by bringing together artists and scholars who work on migrant arts in major European cities. One of the additional goals of the Institute for European Studies is to create a platform for multidisciplinary discussions where scholars and authors from different professions working on related topics can think together on this platform. So rather than hosting speakers individually, we would like to bring them together in panels such as this to stimulate new synergies and conversations. So in this period today, uh, the landscape architect, uh, Martin Ryan Cano from Topetec One, who is known for his urban park project, among other things, uh, in one of Copenhagen's most diverse areas, uh, will talk about his practice, followed by art historian Pamela Corre uh, from University of London, who will explore the works of, by Southeast Asian artists in Europe. And finally, literature professor Leslie Edelson from our own Cornell University, who writes on emergent literatures, often associated with minority and migrant populations in Germany, will read Emine Sergi Esdamar's fiction with Hannah Arendt. So the speakers will make about a 25-minute presentation each, uh, and then it will be followed by a Q&A, and then we have a reception afterwards. Uh, I'll introduce our speakers one by one immediately um, before their presentation. So I'll start with our first speaker, Martin uh, Ryan Cano, who was born in Buenos Aires. He studied art history at Frankfurt University and landscape architecture at the Technical Universities of Hanover and Karlsruhe. After working in the office of Peter Walker and uh, Martha Schwartz in San Francisco, he founded Topotec One in 1996. Topotec One uh, partakes in a wide variety of international projects uh, and the office has received the first prize in various competitions. Uh, and the office has also re uh, received many awards and prizes including uh, the Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2016. Martin has been appointed as a guest professor in different academic institutions in Europe and North America such as University of Pennsylvania and Harvard University. Presently, he's teaching at the Dessau Institute for Architecture. He frequently lectures uh, at internationally renowned universities and cultural institutions, and he regularly serves on competition juries. Uh, the title of his talk today is Migratory Landscapes. So I'm very much looking forward. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much for uh, having invited me to, to show my project uh, or, or, or my perspective on your theme here. Um, as you heard, I'm a landscape architect, so I thought it would be important to show, let's say, uh, on, on, on every issue that we encounter on our everyday life or on, or on our academic life, there is always, let's say, the personal, uh, there is the ed educational or the professional background, but obviously also the personal background uh, to these things. In that case, the project I'm going to show that deals with the issues of immigration was for me a very relevant one as, uh, as me myself moved uh, when I was a 13-year-old child from Argentina to Germany, which was uh, quite, a, quite an experience. And, um, and, and so uh, I think that's, that's relevant. For me, the question uh, beside that is what can we, from, from each perspective, what can we provide or make uh, processes or how can we accompany, accompany certain processes that happen uh, through changes, how can we accompany them from different perspectives, from different uh, 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 professions. So from my, from my point of view, again, probably I'm going to say things that for the, the, the people from the humanities or from, or from other research might be uh, common, but still I would like to, to make them part of my introduction to the project I'm going to show to you. And it has to do, let's say, with the different nature and the change of immigration and the different facets of immigration that uh, actually are alwa uh, always thrown together uh, all at once. And um, so I think, and this graphic actually shows it a little bit that in the end, you know, uh, one of the main issues of immigration that changed uh, 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 in the course of the last century is that uh, immigration is not anymore, let's say, a, a one-way street. It's much more a constant ongoing process. So people aren't anymore just moving from one country to the other and that's the end of the story, so they have to adapt and that's it. They kind of uh, stay in a constant moving situation. Uh, it, can be a diff it can be a moment in life where they go to study somewhere, they can stay there or not, they can go back and forth, they can also live. There are many people nowadays that live in different places, that commute actually not only from New Jersey to New York, but from whatever, from London to New York, that live on, a, on, 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 on different continents on a constant base. And um, so this kind of, uh, of dynamis dynamism is actually also new in terms of asking ourselves if, if one of the core issues of immigration and we heard it from Esra, she, uh, during the introduction about the, the, the nature of immigration in Germany, has to do with the question of uh, identity. What means identity and how, how does identity changes over, over the course of a life with this kind of experiences? And obviously it's not only you don't, uh, uh, and, uh, and let's say there's maybe two ideas about identity. One, let's say a more rather strict idea that identity is something given and natural and DNA and a little bit fascistic, so you are the one that you are because your parents were those they, they are etc etc or the other idea that you uh, uh, obviously depend on your on your uh, uh, on your ancestors but that you have also the freedom to partly decide who you want to become or let's say work on you, on who you want to become and uh, and decide slightly for yourself also who you want to be or not so all these questions again are very dynamic so it's not uh, they don't have a beginning and an end it's an ongoing uh, fluidum of time space and uh, and movement and so that um, thinking of the garden, let's say, as, a, as an analogy, I always thought that it was an interesting thing uh, of thinking that, um, because you know gardens as being the, the let's say, the, 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 the original typology of my profession are always places that in the end only exist with a constant cultivation. So the idea that you actually never stop working on them and anyway you're going to die as the garden does. Anyway, the garden is going, the wilderness is going to take over whatever you do. But the idea that you hopelessness work on something that is hopeless, it gives you a lot of hope. And so I thought that this, uh, in that sense, the garden could be an interesting analogy to, uh, to, 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 to think of, uh, of identity, not as something that you, that you start and then you finish, but it actually, in, the life, in your own lifetime, but in general, is something that is constantly being redefined. So, as I said, there are two directions. One being, uh, and this is in, in, in German, uh, in Germany, saying in German, saying that the that the burka is is being forbidden in, in France. But by the way, we have a political discussion now in Germany going on to forbid uh, any kind of covering of your head for little children. Uh, so this is what, what is happening in Europe now, or what also happens in, in, in here and many other places, is to use repression 
to, um, uh, to avoid the insecurities, the conflicts, the contradictions that all these processes of finding new identities produce. So, uh, uh, so, not, so it's, it's like if you don't show the problems, the po problems are not there, you know, just don't talk about them, then they're gone. So this is, this is part of our policy nowadays that happens in Germany, that happens in, in Switzerland, where minarets have been forbidden <coughs> in, uh, in inner cities, by the way, uh, a uh, vote by the people that was initiated uh, by architects who said the minarets don't fit architectonically and uh, traditionally into the into the Swiss cities. However, so this is what we have. On the other on the other hand, the European history is also a history of emancipation. Uh, uh, it's a it's a, uh, uh, let's say of uh, emancipation with violence and emancipation without violence. But it has been a constant ongoing process. Uh, uh, from oppression to, to liberation, and so that uh, uh, and if you look at the at the social conflicts we have now, the most deprived groups in our society uh, are probably the immigrants. So that in the end, we also can use, let's say, the very classical instruments uh, of Marxism, if you want, uh, uh, of liberation and uh, and uh, and emancipation that usually also came from the people themselves. So because one of the uh, one of the problems of of, uh, of immigration today. Is that um, is that the, the the core of initiation and the core of liberation doesn't come mostly from the immigrant communities themselves, but are kind of regulated t uh, top down. So the question is when. But it's the same with everyone, you know. It, it took Marx to, uh, probably it took hundred years after Marx to have the liberation of the proletarians. It took uh, hundred years after Mendelssohn to have the emancipation of the Jews, etc., etc. Et you can p speak about the emancipation of women, of children, of whatever you want. So the question for us in Europe and maybe in many other places is: How are we going to? Uh, confront these kind of conflicts? Do we want to cultivate these conflicts? Do you want to live with them, tolerate them, and also don't get always nervous if things are not going perfectly well? Or do we want to repress things so that we also not get nervous, but we cover up problems that obviously will explode on some point? So, and this was, I, I like this sentence that I, that I, that I found. Uh, Jens Stoltenberg was the prime minister of uh, Norway when there was this attack on, on the island in, uh, I forgot the name of the island actually, in uh, uh, where these young, young people uh, uh, set, um, campground was set up and this crazy guy went in and, and killed everyone. He said actually, uh, he, he said, he, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't these events and these situations that occur constantly uh, make us change our position. So we have to be, if things like that happen, we actually have to react. Uh, 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 it's a little bit Christian, but we have to put the other cheek actually uh, uh, and let that one be hit as well so that we don't get actually uh, changed by, by these kind of actions. We, we have to, uh, in that way, fortify our liberal beliefs. So uh, what is interesting about gardens, gardens always been used by, uh, uh, obviously, uh, on a big scale by, by wealthy people, by states, to fortify their ideas, ideals, and also, let's say, their new identities. If you think of the Baroque garden, uh, uh, that is a mix, let's say, of total, total, totalitarianism and enlightenment. No? So it was about creating a rational order on one side, that would be the idea of the enlightenment, and on the other side it was to, to have this kind of total control over, uh, uh, over plants, over space, etc. So, and, and, um, and if you would have had these ideas and just would have talked about them or explained them, they wouldn't have been as forceful than if you would build them. And building them, and that's a big difference also to architecture. If you have a building, a building always looks kind of made. If you think of a, of a tree, you usually wouldn't think that it has been planted, actually. A tree has a kind of a self, an, of a selfness. It's always a bit godly, you know? It's, it's natural. It's, it's, it's given. So it feels when you have trees growing in a place, when you have, let's say, landscape made, it feels like that it's a, that it's a space force that embraces and... and, and, uh, and, and um, enforces uh, 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 your roots in the mere sense of the, of the word. You are rooted in that landscape. If this tree belongs to you, if you are uh, the, 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 the person in charge of that space, you are rooted in that space, you belong here, you are someone from here, okay? And usually these kind of actions happen from people that actually not necessarily were from there. They were used to manipulate uh, 
uh, uh, uh, to manipulate visitors, to manipulate viewers. It was also, you have to imagine if you would arrive in one of, on, of these uh, Baroque gardens, you know, and you would see this, this incredible uh, achievement, obviously you would be very, very impressed. And, and, uh, and if you go to Versailles till today, you are always much more impressed with, uh, with the landscape, uh, with the gardens that happen than with the, with the castle. However, the project I'm going to show to you, it's more rooted in a, another garden style, that is the English landscape garden, the Romantic garden. What is interesting about this garden is that its origins are actually pictures. You know, you might have heard the term picturesque. When we talk about the English garden, the Romantic garden, we speak about the picturesque. One of the reasons is that the origin, the origin of this uh, garden style is actually pictures. So it was, there were two French painters, Claude Laurent and Nicolas Poussin, who developed, who developed this kind of uh, uh, historical collages, this kind of eclectic collages. You, know, you have the castle of the, of the angel from Rome, you have the Vesuve from Naples, so you can actually mix your space the way you want. Yeah? And English aristocrats, when they saw these pictures, uh, maybe similar to clients today, said, I actually would like to have a garden that works like that. And I would like to make my personal mix my personal mix that actually defines my, uh, my identity. So for example, in some gardens you, you will see if the owners were more, more enlightened, more liberal, let's say, they would go more for neoclassical and classical stuff, more Greek stuff. If they would be more nationalistic and more, and, and more conservative, however, they would go more for, for Gothic uh, uh, copies um, of little monuments, etc., so that they could uh, 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 create the mixes the way they wanted to be seen. And um, so what I thought uh, interesting in that, uh, in that, uh, in that context, um, and obviously uh, everything started maybe, or not everything started, I mean, in, in humanity we always have been uh, uh, moving things, plants and people um, around the globe, but the velocity in which this happens and the, and the constancy in which this happens were probably started in the 19th century, especially with the, with the, um, uh, with the British Empire, and, uh, and, and so, uh, uh, and, and these ideas that you, um, that suddenly you can change the, the, the place where, where plants actually grow defines maybe this idea that I want to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to describe to you today. The, the cedar, for example, the Lebanese cedar, one of the most beautiful trees in the world. It doesn't grow anywhere nicer than in England, you know? It's very unhappy in Lebanon, yeah? So thank God the English took it to England, you know? What would be an English garden without the Lebanese cedar? Look at this thing, it's so incredibly happy in this constant rain uh, 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 there. So, but then it's a question, what is this cedar actually? Is this actually, is this cedar Lebanese? Is this cedar English? So, and, and, and this, and, uh, you know, if it was brought to England as a seed, yeah, or in a, in a ship, as a little plant, and then it grew all its life in this bad weather. What, what is it? Is it English? Is it, is it foreign? And, um, and what I think in the end that it's, uh, and that's what I'm interested in, that, it's, that you don't need to decide. It's actually both, you know? So it's not about deciding who you are. It's actually keeping always very flexible to be always capable to become a little bit someone else and to let, let's say, the context uh, uh, de define you and, and who you are. But that doesn't mean that you have to give up anything. So this idea that one culture overcomes the other, I think in that respect is actually old school. And, and the idea that we had maybe when immigration was a one-way street. Yeah. This, is a, 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 this is one of these examples. You know, these gardens were actually Nothing in them was English, you know. All the plants were brought from the Americas, from Asia, from all the colonies they found. The architecture was some bad copies from some temples uh, in other places of the world. So, but you know how we call these gardens today? We call them English gardens, English landscape gardens. Nothing in them beside the weather is actually English, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what I want to say is that in the end, the process also of appropriation and of identity it's something that is an ongoing process and is never ended. So, so that, uh, that, 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 uh, that and, and the garden, let's say, is a good catalysator, or also the public space is a good catalysator for these processes. Another story, you heard of The Hobbit uh, 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 in, in New Zealand, you know, they did the movie uh, in a farm in New Zealand, uh, because I don't know why they did it there, they, they found a, a very good place uh, 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 that looked the, the way they wanted, and, um, and they've closed, they finished the filming, etc. But then people started to come to the, to the site and wanted to see the site of the Hobbits, you know. And out of that, actually, something developed that suddenly it's 100% New Zealand now, 
you know. And even even the, the Air New Zealand is the is the official air carrier of Middle Earth, you know. So there you see how how uh, reality, let's say, the narrative and the reality suddenly get more and more together, and these processes uh, uh, of creating this kind of uh, identity narratives are faster and faster, and obviously are also misused by capitalism and other things. The project I'm going to show you very fast, so that I uh, don't overdo the time too much, um, is a project in Copenhagen. It was a competition uh, in the north part of Copenhagen. 99% of the people who live here are immigrants. The competition was started by a, by a foundation called Real Dania, who asked in the competition how the public space, to create a public space that would enhance and, um, and create better situations for the immigrants who live, who live in this area. So what we thought after this presentation, for us, the, let's say there would be two, two issues about that we wanted to create here. One, is it, is, is it possible to, let's say, upgrade or update the ideas of the English landscape garden that we can recreate and remix our identity the way we want and it's not something given. We just have a choice, let's say, of putting up the things that are relevant for us or for a place altogether. So to continue this idea of, uh, of, of, uh, of cultivating, let's say, the process of finding out who we are and not as a, as an end, as, as, as a, as a dead end process but a continuous uh, dynamic process. Second question was how can we because this is how can we uh, fight against the repression of uh, objects in the public space of presence in the public space you know the immigrants as as we heard in the introduction today as well in especially in Germany but in Europe in general I would say are needed as a workforce but uh, were never welcome uh, uh, to really uh, be too present so uh, let's say their objects were never allowed. So as you can see in Switzerland, minarets, mosques are actually forbidden to be in the center of the city. So they, sh they should work, they should be there, but they shouldn't be present. They shouldn't have any kind of coming out into the presence in, the pu in public life. So the idea was to create a place where the objects of the immigrants would have a place to come out uh, and, and be part of the public space. You know, when you immigrate a country, you usually take yourself and maybe have a bag with you, but you are not going to take, let's say, these everyday objects that usually are part of your, of your reality. When you live in a place, you have these things that are kind of, the, you all even stop seeing them because they are so normal to you that they become part of, the, of, uh, 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 of what also gives you a certain security that you are at home, you know? And this kind of normality we thought would be nice to have some of these objects in, the, in, the, uh, in that space. And another thing that we thought it could be interesting is, idea, is the idea of translation, you know. The cedar, the Lebanese cedar, or the Greek temple that I showed you, went through a process of translation, okay? And, um, and this, this idea that you can translate objects, that also objects, they don't have to be originals. All this uh, frenetic uh, uh, believing in the original works also more on the fascistic side of this process, okay? So it's important to rethink uh, and, and much more thinking processes in which objects actually also uh, go through this, uh, let's say, washing or, or, or process of being changed constantly. So the idea that you translate, that you become someone else, and I was telling that yesterday as well, you know, not only um, your mind starts to change when you live in different languages and start to change between them, you know, also your body changes, you know, your, your physiognomy starts to change, you know. In America, for example, all people look a little bit like hamsters, you know, because they usually speak more here in front here, you know. And, uh, <coughs> sorry, and in France, to make it a bit fair, and in France they have very thick lips because they fart while they're speaking, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. So, joke, but a little bit serious, the, our physiognomy, our ways we, also use our body changes in the moment that we also change culture or are in different cultures. So in, in that sense, as we are designers and we make things, um, we also we were interested in this idea that it's not about uh, uh, who you are or who you originally were, but how you go through these processes of change and how this process of change can, provide, can make everyone happy somehow. So to make the story short, in that, in that uh, park everything is foreign, but it's not foreign in, the ter in, in terms of we just translocated it, we just brought it from somewhere else and put it here, but it always went through a process of, uh, of translation, let's say, of um, uh, um, and yeah, of translation, of transforming. So one of these objects, uh, and so one thing I didn't mention, half relevant is that people were supposed to participate, but you know, these people, 
are busy, they have problems with their life, they're poor, they change the country, they don't speak the language, they do not know actually how to participate. Participation is part of a cultural uh, code that you have to know to know how to participate. So the idea was to let them participate in a curatorial way, asking them for objects from their countries. So one of them was this, uh, this, this, this sign, a guy uh, from, um, from Muscat proposed it to be put on the square and we translated it then and made that thing out of it. And the idea is, um, or the, there's obviously different layers on it. One is a little bit the symbolism that has uh, a religious, a little bit of re religious uh, background, but also it, it plays with the ideas of humor. So instead of the star, we have a tooth to be holy. And, um, and then it plays also with the ideas of translation in terms of formality. So that object was some kind of whatever. And this one suddenly it's a Nordic cold object so that it's actually Danish. Uh, and or Nordic, you know, so it, it's both. It's, it has the symbolism of Islam, it has the humor of, a, of, of dentists, and it has the, 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 let's say, the coolness of the Nordic, yeah? And this is what we, and this is something that we did with many objects, yeah? So, uh, as you can see. <clears throat> Another issue that was relevant for us was cultivation means always that you have to be, you have to be careful with morality, okay? You can't be too much of a, of a Puritan. Yeah? So you have to actually accept to a certain extent that we humans are assholes. Yeah? And, <laughs> and the question is just how to frame this, this inability to be, to, be, uh, to be nice that we have. And, um, and that's the reason we have psychologists, but, well, that's the reason we have the church, and, and more recently that we have Freud, yeah? especially here in New York. And so we said, and uh, you heard I'm from Buenos Aires, actually, just to, to mention, Buenos Aires has a, a, a bigger amount of psychologists than New York per capita, just to, to but so it's similarly neurotic, yeah? So, and, um, however, the idea was that, in, in, and you know when you go to your shrink, when you go through a process, the, the, uh, a shrink will not solve your problems, he's going to reframe your problems and, and tell you how you can, uh, um, um, uh, let's say, live with them, reframing them, giving them a new significance. So, you know, you go and tell my mom never loved me, whatever, and then he is going to tell you, well, she was busy and whatever, you have to understand her, and then you will reframe it and say, okay, good, it's maybe not as bad as I thought, whatever. That's how, to, to simplify it, and maybe in the public space, instead of erasing problems and getting rid of problems, we should confront them and reframe them. So this neighborhood had a lot to do with, uh, with violence, there's a lot of things going on, and you know, if, if, if there's a fight on bare ground and one guy is hitting the face of the other guy, this is a crime. But if the same thing happens 40 centimeters above ground with a little bit of strings around it, then it sports. So, and this is what I mean, how a process of transformation is not about avoiding the violence, it's actually how can we use these forces of a place like we use the forces of nature when we do gardens, how can we use, let's say, the negative forces of a place to make, uh, to make this uh, 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 process more tolerable and, uh, and enjoyable? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to the discussion after the juxtaposition of um, these three lectures. Um, so while we are setting up um, the system, I would like to introduce our second speaker, uh, Pamela Corre, uh, who received her PhD uh, in the history of art from Cornell University. Uh, and she subsequently <laughs> took up a, a post as lecturer in South Asian, Southeast Asian art at SOAS, uh, University of London in uh, 2015. Her current book project is provisionally titled uh, The City in Time, Contemporary Art and Urban Form in Vietnam and Cambodia and is drawn from her doctoral dissertation research which was supported by fellowships uh, such as Fulbright um, and the Center for Khmer Studies. She has co-organized international conferences uh, at the Herbert Johnson Museum of Art. Uh, she uh, organized some, uh, a conference on Vietnamese ceramics uh, as well as at MoMA. Uh, and her uh, uh, writings appear in Art Journal, Yishu, uh, Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art, Journal of Modern C uh, Craft, uh, and so on, as well as in numerous exhibition catalogues and platforms of art criticism. Her paper today is titled Neon Rice Fields and Proxy Voices, Works by Southeast Asian Artists in Europe. Thank you. 
uh, first, I just wanted to thank Ezra and uh, the Center for uh, European Studies um, for inviting me and hosting me. And it's really wonderful to have this opportunity to come back to Cornell. And um, I really enjoyed sort of homecoming. Um, and I just wanted to mention, too, that this is very new research and um, some of my thinking is quite raw here so this is also a great opportunity to share some of my ideas and hopefully get some feedback. <coughs> so today I'll be sharing some new research and reflections on three artists who were born in Southeast Asia and who via different routes of migration through Europe and the UK have settled in London. What I want to focus on in this talk is how the works speak to experiences of travel, exile, alienation, and cultural representation, with a focus on selected artworks that I think provide a more intriguing connective dialogue than the ethno-national categorization of the artists. The artworks I'll be discussing have in common an interest in the use of voice and the sonic imagination to compel the viewers or the listeners thinking about the, significa the, significa <laughs> the significations of materials and mediums in conjunction with sound in a way that disrupts a reliance on optical comprehension as the primary means of perception and processing. Whereas sonic materiality may predominantly be used to describe the material and tactile qualities of sound, I use it to describe the ways in which materials themselves invoke sound, audibility, and language. And in the end, I'll conclude with some rough thoughts about these artworks in relation to silence and representation, as they may have something to do with the historical positionality of Southeast Asian diasporas in Europe and the UK. Media theorists Anne Balsamo and Jonathan Stern have claimed that sonic imaginations, quote, reproduce cultural understandings at every turn, end quote, and that, quote, there is no knowledge of sound that comes from outside culture, only knowledge that works from particular limits. These limits, in turn, work like affordances, baseline assumptions and massive traditions to build from as well as conventions worth playing with or struggling against." End quote. Balsamo and Stern both contend that this imagination is performative, often aiming to satisfy and frustrate expectations in order to produce something meaningful and engaging for themselves and their communities and audiences. I cite this excerpt to set up what I believe to be a recurring impulse in the work of Lao-born artist Vong Paupanit, who gained international acclaim when he was nominated for the Turner Prize in 1993. The Turner Prize has been awarded almost annually to an artist of British citizenship or residence in the UK since 1984, and it is the most prestigious contemporary art award in the UK, comparable with the Hugo Boss Prize in the US. Palpinet was nominated for Neon Rice Field, which you see here, which found various formal iterations according to site. <clears throat> At the time of his nomination, he was also obtaining British citizenship, having emigrated first to France in his childhood for his education, finding himself then in exile in 1975 <coughs> with the victory of the communist Pathet Lao. He would pursue his studies at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Aix-en-Provence, where he met his British wife, Claire Aubussier, <clears throat> and the two subsequently settled in the UK in 1985. His shortlisting for the Turner Prize drew quite a bit of controversy in the British press, namely surrounding the question of his eligibility. For example, critic Brian Sewell's uh, query, I thought the Turner Prize was for a British artist. Reception of Palpinet's installation, alongside those of the other nominees, continued to be embroiled in ongoing questions of the nature of contemporary art today and what makes for good art, particularly in the context of 1990s Britain. Reductive narrative assumptions drawing on the East meets West trope emerged as baselines for public criticism surrounding Neon Rice Field, invoked by its title and materials and perception of its author's ethno-national identity. On these assumptions, Palpinet refused to speak, in a sense. Quote, silence is the only word I have found that describes it. 
Silence is to do with the eyes, the look. The look can stop words, end quote. Through his entreaty to silence, Palpinet asked the viewer to yield their assumptions to a deeper engagement with various modalities of perception. And while he emphasized looking, I would suggest that this was one of several entry points into a synesthetic processing of the work. Claire Aubussier wrote about how the materialities of the two components, the rice and the neon tubes, activated one another, elevating their respective capacities as mediums. And Palpinet also described the olfactory sensations triggered in the room as grains of rice were slowly toasted by the neon. The ways in which neon rice field was staged in various site-specific exhibition iterations could also evoke a range of associations between architecture and landscape. In the Tate's version, the geometric furrows resemble both the troughs made in the plowing of rice fields, but at the same time are reminiscent of motifs from the modernist urban ruins in the artist's hometown of Savannakhet, Laos. At the level of the sonic imagination, rice and neon host illusory binaries about site and place, whether the bucolic setting of the rural or the hum and buzz of commerce and entertainment typically cited in the urban. The work may thus appear to bring incongruous elements into a harmonious unity. But for Palpinet, neon rice field was meant to defer any easy readings. Scrutiny of the wall label should have alerted the viewer to the fact that the rice was in fact an American product. And recognition of its site of manufacture, together with an imagining of the sound of some seven to eight tons of rice grains being mechanically processed, poured, and transported, as invoked simply through the scale of the work, beckons a troubling of easy tropes about Asian rurality and traditional labor. Hence, Palpinet's invocation to silence, whether in the experience of the work or in any quick narrative interpretations. In this use of silence as a symbolic, political, interpretive, and formal strategy, Anna Maria Gauthier has aptly proposed that silence provides, quote, the potential of questioning the binary logic of apparent opposites by dissolving one into the other, presence as absence, emptiness as plenitude, quietness as expressivity, silence as intensity of life, end quote. I'd like to move on to discuss works by other artists here, but I'd like to note that while the controversy surrounding Palpinet's nomination in 1993 is considered to have played a formative role in the re-articulation of the Turner Prize's eligibility criteria to specify an artist born in or resident in Great Britain rather than British artist, it, would also, it also may have marked a turn in Palpinet's own work. Whereas once he discussed his work with reference to memory and place, and to some extent, diasporic longing, after 1993, his statements became more austere. He continued to use forms evoking frustrated language, neon as a medium, of, as a medium and sight of sonic materiality, and the moving image to investigate and destabilize the conjunction of looking, listening, and reading as modes of consolidating identification and memory. But silence, as a formal resource and of desired contextual explanations, would further amplify the density of interpretive thinking and pleasure of perception conjured by his work. So I now want to discuss a project by the London-based Singaporean artist Erica Tan um, that has evolved through a research-based project surrounding the historical figure of Halima Binti Abdullah, a Malayan weaver who was brought to the 1924 British Empire exhibition in Wembley to be displayed performing her craft at the Malayan Pavilion. Halima died in England of pneumonia, and her remains were never repatriated to Malaya. However, <clears throat> her weaving loom remains in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum. What I'd like to show you right now is a clip from a presentation by Proxy, a 2014 digital work and performative lecture in which Halima stands in as a proxy for Erica Tan at a publication launch in Singapore. So. Dear guests, participants, and contributors to the book, terima kasih. Thank you for coming. Firstly, I would like to apologize on behalf of the artist Eriki Tan.
She had hoped to be here in person to celebrate along CD and to thank the various contributors and producers of the book. Tam cannibalizes, why don't you sila mengkanibalkan kami mau tak? However, she is unable to be present and I promised I would try in her absence to speak for her. Before I continue, Erika encouraged me to give a little introduction to myself, saying that on these occasions, audiences often require if not demand to no one's provenance. This is especially in the case when you step in to replace someone. My name is Halimah Binti Abdullah, and I am also an artist, a performance artist. You may not yet be familiar with my work as I am based in England, and have not been able as yet to return to Singapore I have, however, Some works collected at the Victoria and the Albert Museum and the British Museum. I have also participated in one of the biggest exhibitions in London, which took over an entire area in Wembley. You may be more familiar now with Wembley through its connection to football. However, the initial stadium was built in 1923. I know as the British Empire Stadium, the performances I undertook for this exhibition were durational works, taking place during the day and night. You might describe these works as socially engaged or relational works, although I think of them more as provocations to the status quo. We perhaps could be seen as social animators. Given that the performances were so long, I in fact ended up staying at the exhibition site along with the other performers who lived too far away to make a daily chomute. We treated it as a residency space, sharing the experiences of the daily performances. and recounting the various encounters we had with our audience. On the whole, the work was very well received and we had very good attendance, although there was also the usual critical responses to socially engaged practices in terms of seeing it as instrumentalist puppetry, but on the whole, there was a lot of positive responses especially to the way we enacted our characters. People often spoke about our free and duliness. Along with the performances, we also were able to come out of Chos to Mesu to speak and visit the rest of the exhibition or enjoy the company of other performance artists. It is at this exhibition that I met Erika. She had been trying to make contact with me for quite a while. However, due to the fastness of the exhibition, she had always managed to somehow miss me. So this digital work sources processed speech in a gesture that is both humorous and melancholy, using a parodic computerized voice with a Malay pigeon accent to intensify through contrast the somber nature of Halima's biography. It is one of a number of iterations throughout Tan's project that reflects on art historical canonization and the place of women, nationalist historiography, the general absence of Southeast Asia and British post-colonial consciousness. Note, for example, the invisibility of Burma and British M Malaya in the controversial 2015 Tate exhibition, Artist and Empire and the lingering issues of representation and marginalization surrounding Southeast Asian artists and curatorial frameworks in Britain and Europe today. Tan's work has long been preoccupied with creating connections with Singapore, and her project on Halima has comprised a number of expressive forms, from staged performances by amateur women debaters to multimedia installations in which the weavers loom stands in as historical specter, screen, and voice. Tan's work can be understood to some extent through the archival impulse in contemporary art as described by Hal Foster. 
Letters and other archival materials provide one means of seeking out a historical subject, and the margins, or in the case of Halima, a footnote, thrill for what they lack as much as for what they contain. Artists are among those who endeavor to extract those footnotes and bring them into central focus. In the context of this work in Great Britain, however, Tan deliberately enacts an archival excess to, in order to test the boundaries between author and subject. Tan has described the ways in which her own positionality as an artist has been obscured by British ethno-national classifica uh, classifications and art historiography, whether as a black artist, a Chinese or Oriental artist, or as one of many artists grouped together at the Diaspora Pavilion at the 2017 Venice Biennale. In this sense, the figure of Halima has served as a proxy for the artist, that is, she has been a means through which Tan has tested out a voicing of her own position. In a presentation by proxy, voice is the material element that would seem to provide a promise of consciousness for something meant to occupy the other side of the divide between human and non-human, a ghost in the machine, as Maladin Dolar puts it. As such, it is this promise that artists might grasp in their efforts to make themselves into mediums, or proxies, of the forgotten or the invisible subjects of history. Voice comes into metaphorical play in discourses of repatriation, reconstitution, and agency, but the question of literally realizing these actions and concepts involves risk of superimposition. Tan's scripting of Halima's monologue and digital constitution of her voice asks the question of not just how she is ventriloquizing Halima through vocal configuration, but to what extent does the artist want Halima to ventriloquize her? We might see the artist here as a medium in both senses of the word. As Tan notes, this compulsion to speak as and inevitably for Halima is a fraught endeavor, and the question of the ethics of representation is an immediate concern. The use of the computerized, heavily accented voice with its occasional semantic glitches and its mediatic anachronicity make this tension self-evident. Voice here is more than a medium. It is one of the metaphors of incompleteness that recur throughout the project. Paradoxical and unreconcilable as something embodied and absent, part of the body and apart from the body, voice is a support, but also that which is supported, a fundamentally undecidable element that fixes a space between the interior and exterior self and also between subjects. Voice then, for the artist, is Halima Bintin Abdullah as a spectral presence or figure of indetermin uh, indeterminacy, aspiration, and archival imagination. Halima comes into being through scripts and images, but also, if not primarily, through the voice that the artist attempts to resurrect. While one question at the heart of this project is how to voice Halima, another is how Halima becomes the artist's voice. All right, I'd now like to share the work of the final artist um, and then conclude. So um, Sung Thieu is a younger artist recently settled in London after completing her MFA at the Royal College of Art. Thieu was born in 1987 in northern Vietnam and migrated to Germany with her mother at the age of five, having to make the journey on foot through the Czech forest. She describes her work as rooted in the experiences of migration and non-belonging she, exp you know, she experienced as an illegal alien in Germany, and then as a Vietnamese artist who felt little connection with her homeland. From the specificities of the German dimensions of the Vietnamese diaspora, the artist has traced broader narratives of displacement, travel, and historiography in her work. As an emerging artist, her work draws continuities with those of an older generation of artists from Vietnam who have centered international attention primarily through the Vietnamese American perspective. But Diu's work introduces avenues into lesser known transnational histories of Vietnam. The historical relationship between Germany and Vietnam sets the context for Diu's biography and much of her work. Germany had hosted several waves of Vietnamese migrants since the 1950s when the Northern Democratic Republic of Vietnam and the German Democratic Republic both belonged to the Socialist Bloc. In 1980, the two governments signed an agreement for North Vietnamese to be sent as temporary contract workers to the GDR, filling a labor shortage while stimulating a flow of migrant remittances 
to help rebuild the post-war Vietnamese economy. In 1989, while West Germany continued to host and give permanent residence rights to refugees from South Vietnam, whose exodus had escalated after the 1975 communist takeover, the now unified Socialist Republic of Vietnam sent almost 60,000 Vietnamese contract workers to East Germany. However, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and German reunification in 1989, many Vietnamese in former East Germany lost their contracts, and despite the German government's financial stimulus to repatriate them, many had established Berlin as their home and resolved to stay. Having already opened a niche within the GDR garment industry, many former Vietnamese contract workers improvised new informal and not quite illegal economies and channels of garment and commodity production and exchange. <clears throat> Routes of appropriation and reproduction are evoked by Diu's work Emotion <coughs> Refuge, which comments on the signature plaid of a Chinese manufactured plastic bag known as a laundry bag or a refugee bag, depending on its context of use, which was then appropriated by high-end designers like Celine. In the 1990s, at the time of the artist's settlement in Germany, the financial viability of these informal enterprises by Vietnamese communities, alongside Germany's economic growth, attracted more Vietnamese migrants who had similar, similarly worked in other areas of Eastern Europe and who would cross the border illegally, but could apply for asylum and limited avenues for permanent residence specific to the Vietnamese situation. In 2000, uh, 2015, Diu staged a form of public intervention and art exhibition in a major Vietnamese market in Berlin. The Dong Xuan Center was established in 2003 as a major shopping and food center and import-export hub largely run by generations of immigrants from North Vietnam, hence its naming after a celebrated market in Hanoi. For her project, Subnational Enterprise, it's not me, is it? Oh, okay. For her project, Subnational Enterprise, Diu received consent from the owner of a LED and electronics shop to reprogram its LED screens, typically used to flash shop sign slogans, with scrolling dates and the names of countries in the Soviet Eastern Bloc that had signed contract worker and migration agreements. Diu also fabricated a rebranded counterfeit MP3 player edition, pre-programmed with a sound work, sampling traditional Vietnamese stringed music, recorded ambient and vocal backdrops in the popular department store KDV, and product placement lines from movies like Breakfast at Tiffany's or Sex in the City. A sonic assemblage and meshing tradition, commerce, media, and class. The piece animates a history of Vietnamese migrant entrepreneurship as large numbers of the Vietnamese community had to seek alternative means of subsistence after German reunification and the end of their worker contracts. Such self-organization took the form of small businesses such as flower shops and temporary marketplaces in their hostels or in vacant buildings where they drew on their personal trade networks to ply in-demand goods and brand name reproductions. Intended to be worn by the listener while browsing through displays and combing the crowds on a busy Saturday at the Dong Xuan Center, the piece situates the experience within the marketplace's transnational, cultural, and historical consciousness, forging a gray area where low end and high end, the informal and the formal sound. Okay. okay. All right, I'll quickly conclude. <clears throat> So in conclusion, in each of these works, sonic materiality complicates semantic significations as expressed through language or narrative interpretations predicated on visual perception. I'm continuing to think about the resonance of such artistic strategies in the context of the UK, where Asians continue to occupy ambiguous forms of recognition between classifications of Asian or Oriental the latter term still designating those glossed as East Asian or more typically Chinese, so too have these ambiguities manifested in radical projects of self-representation and art historiography, most notably within the British Black Arts Movement, in which artists of Asian descent, and particularly those who weren't from China or South Asia, were situated uneasily 
I'm also thinking of the ways that Asian American artists in the US, and particularly those with Vietnamese heritage, have mediated visual material, such as iconic photographs and film stills, to subvert the consolidation of Vietnam as metaphor vis-a-vis -vis the American nationalist narrative. Such a visual historiography pertaining to Southeast Asia isn't as predominant in the UK, and I wonder whether the invocation of voice, speech, sound, and listening is a way of refusing such a politics of identification as relayed through the visual, while also summoning <coughs> recognition. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, our final and third uh, speaker is Leslie Edelson. Um, uh, she's uh, a professor of German studies at Cornell University, former director of the Interdisciplinary Institute for German Cultural Studies, and the current chair of the Department of German Studies. She teaches modern German literature with an emphasis on literature since 1945 and transnational theories of culture, difference, migration, and futurity. Uh, her monographs include Crisis of Subjectivity, Making Bodies, Making History, The Turkish Turn in Contemporary German Literature Toward a New uh, Critical Grammar of Migration, and Cosmic Miniatures uh, and the Future Sense, uh, Alexander Kluge's uh, 21st Century Literary Experiment <coughs> in German Culture and Narrative Form. And the title of her paper is The Future as Contested Ground, Rethinking Emine Sergi Özdemar's European Fiction with Hannah Arendt. So, uh, many, many thanks to Ezra for organizing this uh, wonderful and important panel, and many warm thanks to Martin and Pamela for your really inspiring talks. I'm very honored to be on this panel with you. And uh, many thanks to each of you for uh, taking time out of a busy, um, rainy day to be here. I really appreciate that a lot. Um, I was going to say you could leave the image up. Um, I uh, am always interested in contingency factors. Um, uh, but I will just plunge into uh, my talk, which is about uh, print literature and writing. So written in exile from Nazi Germany in 1945, part two of Theodor Adorno's Minima Moralia, Reflections from Damaged Life, opens with a literary miniature about writing. Hinted in Spiegel or Memento, as EFN Jeffcott titles this piece in English translation, includes one of the most captivating descriptions of well-crafted prose I know. Quote, Properly written texts are like spiders' webs, tight, concentric, transparent, well-spun, and firm. They draw into themselves all the creatures of the air. Metaphors flitting hastily through them become their nourishing prey. Subject matter comes winging towards them. The soundness of a conception can be judged by whether it causes one quotation to summon another. Where thought has opened up one cell of reality, it should, without violence by the subject, penetrate the next. It proves its relation to the object as soon as other objects crystallize around it. In the light that it casts on its chosen substance, others begin to glow." End quote. This well-spun web of Adorno's own making, an ostensible homage to coherence, connectivity, and sequence, is immediately followed by this miniature's finale, in which disorder explicitly proliferates in thought and nothing at all seems to glow. Here, Adorno first likens text to a locale in which, quote, the writer sets up house, end quote, before the housekeeping metaphor is tightened and simultaneously begins to disintegrate when we read that for a person, quote, who no longer has a homeland, writing becomes a place to live, end quote. Writing becomes a mark of displacement in this rhetorical shift, and for the generic writer Adorno appears to describe, 
the danger of, quote, filling his pages, end quote, with unruly leftovers stems not only from the literal lack of a storeroom, Speicher in the German, but even more so from the idle allure of seeming continuity in the things and habits one tends to accumulate, including habits of thought. In the end, Adorno writes with self-admonition in the final sentence of this text, quote, quote, the writer is not even allowed to live in his writing, end quote. And readers are left like flies in a web with a sticky paradox in which writing is both the only place to live and a displacement from living at the same time. For all its spatial metaphors, Adorno's memento is also an exilic reflection from damaged life on writing as a break in time. It serves here as a springboard for contemporary reflections on, minor on migration literature and minoritarian writing in 21st century German culture, not with a predictable focus on what is carried over from the past but with curious attention to narrative forms of future making in the breach instead. From the vantage of post-colonial anthropologies of globalization, Arjuna Potterai argues in his book, The Future is Cultural Fact, that cultural forms of future making must be understood as unevenly distributed social goods in the world today. If futurity designates first and foremost a temporal structure rather than a substantive vision of future life, and if it also connotes affective orientation to time as what Niklas Luhmann defines as an interpretation of reality, to what extent, I ask, and how does a minoritarian narrative poetics pertaining to migration help us grasp the social parameters of futurity that literature itself helps engender in so-called other Europe's today. Today I will focus on a little known fictional narrative by Emine Sevgi Özdemar, a prize winning novelist who holds emblematic status on German culture's path from Turkish labor migration of the 1960s to a transcultural poetics of migration in 21st century Europe. Yet I will begin my discussion of this Turkish-German writing not with Özdemar, but with Hannah Arendt, a German-Jewish political theorist whose 1943 essay, We Refugees, famously indicted Jewish forgetting in exile in terms of, quote, an insane optimism which is next door to despair, end quote. Without explicitly referencing futurity, Arendt underscores competing affective relationships to the future in rhetorical terms that stress a spatial configuration. Optimism lives next door to despair. 18 years later, Arendt published a collection of essays on what she called exercises in political thought. Collectively titled Between Past and Future, these essays begin with a preface that should concern us because this preface helps us understand, however indirectly, why her spatial configuration of optimism and despair signals a temporal problematic in Arendt's thinking about futurity. For Arendt, this temporal problematic is by no means confined to any aggregate community of Jews or any other peoples, for it literally affects us all in her view. I shall to attempt, to see, attempt to see how writing in the breach by Özdemar and Arendt Help us understand at least helps us understand at least some narrative forms of future making in contemporary Europe. Writing in 1961 and alluding in part to her earlier work on the human condition from 1958, Arendt saw loss of world as a political feature of the human condition that becomes acutely intensified in the middle of the 20th century. And she cast this feature philosophically as a temporal lücke or gap between past and future. She did not call this gap the present because the gap between past and future was for Arendt a real gap in time in which embodied human agents struggle to establish the meaning of lived time when such meaning is not prescripted by an unbroken temporal succession from pastness into futurity. For Arendt, the relationship between past and future is necessarily and increasingly antagonistic 
by degree, because the future is authorized less and less by any lived past. A meaningful relationship to the future must therefore instead be wrested from the present, which is, however, understood only as a blank spot or open question in time. Gap in time in the English rendition or look at in der Zeit in the German. That is to say, not, not a temporal gap, but a gap in the structure of time. For Arendt, aided and inspired by a par parable from Kafka's diary, such relationships can only be hardly one. The gap between past and future is what she calls, quote, a battlefield and not a home, end quote. Ein Schlachtfeld und kein Zuhause. Two aspects of, are striking in Arendt's formulations about time, and I would like to suggest that these aspects help us open up some new questions about the futurity of other Europe's under the transnational sign of multidimensional minorities and migrations some 50 years later. First, from Arendt's political and philosophical perspectives, tradition as a putative source of meaning is not given or even invented, but always already lost, temporally broken, acutely so from the mid 20th century on, and as she says, quote, for all, end quote. That is to say, in my terms, for society at large and not only for the migrants, minorities, and refugees among us. This is not to say that the temporal gap between past and future is uniformly constituted or socially uncontested, but it does mean that the minoritarian experience of time has something fundamental to teach us about social time and not only for selected groups. Second, for Arendt, if the future is not authorized or prescripted by the pastness of tradition, the meaning of futurity must be scribed in struggle anew without unbroken recourse to the past. I take this to indicate that for Arendt, the most important thing about memory as a mode of thinking rendered in English as, quote, on, only one, though one of the most important modes of thought, end quote, in German as nur eine, wenn auch die wichtigste Art des Denkens. In other words, in the German she says, it's not just one of the most important, it's the most important form of thought, is not its rootedness, so let's say that for Arendt, the most important thing about memory is a mode of thinking, is not its rootedness in historical experience or even any constructed continuity in the present, but its fundamentally broken relationship to futurity as a social structure in time. This futurity is not temporally continuous with the past, but temporally in search of its own grounding, so to speak. Yet Arendt is quick to point out that any such grounding has no ground other than the indexicality of social futurity for which thought allows. And I'm going to read you the German quote and then I'll give you the English translation. Auf diesen kleinen Nicht-Zeitraum, im eigentlichen Herzen der Zeit, kann nur hingewiesen werden. Er kann nicht wie die Welt und die Kultur, in die wir hineingeboren werden, von der Vergangenheit ererbt und kann auch nicht überliefert werden. In English this quote reads, The small, this small non-time space in the very heart of time, unlike the world and the culture into which we are born, can only be indicated, but cannot be inherited and handed down from the past." End quote. Orientations in thought and feeling to this structural gap are what I am going to call future affects. At first glance, Amina Sevgi Özdemar's short prose piece, On the Train, appears to have little to do with future affects in this sense of a structural gap in time. I will argue, however, that this largely overlooked piece of writing by Özdemar has much to teach us about futurity and the heart of time in the 21st century story of so-called other Europe's. First published in the German weekly Die Zeit in October 2008, The text recounts the teleological trajectory of a train traveling from the Turkish border town of Edirne to immigration destinations in Europe, beginning with the Austrian town of Filach 
which lies really close, we are told, to Ingeborg Bachmann's birthplace of Klagenfurt, and from which all the train's passengers will continue on by train or by car in the direction of Holland, France, and Germany to pre-assigned work sites. It's all Europe, we read. The text also alludes in retrospective fashion to the teleological chronology of both transnational labor migration to Germany in the latter part of the 20th century on the one hand and the expanding supranational institutionalization of the European Union in the early part of the 21st century on the other. The pseudo-autobiographical narrative voice of the text belongs to a Turkish woman with some experience traveling repeatedly in both directions between Germany and Turkey, and she too is now on the train to Filaf. As she observes in one longer passage in the voice of recollection, many years ago she had been riding the train to Istanbul together with a Turkish laborer from Frankfurt, a Greek laborer from Dusseldorf, and two Yugoslav laborers from Augsburg. As she explains, quote, at that time there was no Serbia, no Croatia, everything was Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia, end quote. The only language these accidental travel companions in the train compartment shared was German, and they proceeded to translate their songs and images of longing and love into, quote, their broken German, end quote, for each other. This scene of directional affect and multilingual translation into a shared broken language is compounded by something just outside the scene where two old men in the aisle appear, quote, uninterruptedly offering each other cigarettes and crying, end quote. These old men are Turkish fathers who had traveled to Yugoslavia with empty coffins to retrieve the corpses of their adult children victims of traffic accidents in Yugoslavia while en route from Germany to Turkey. This prompts the Turkish narrator to reflect in the present, quote, on every train, death is a passenger too, end quote. Emotional affects of love and grief are strongly in evidence here and the directional storytelling motifs of death, loss, and even a broken language of translation initially seem to serve a narrative continuity of temporal translation from past to present to future. A thematic motif of futurity would also appear to be underscored in the text many supranational allusions to EU expansion in pointedly categorical, chronological, and also affective terms. Quote, when Carl and I boarded this train yesterday in Edione, we didn't know that our passports would be inspected six times on the way to Filach first by not EU Turks, then by EU Bul Bulgarians, then by not EU Serbians, then by soon to be EU Croatians, then by EU Slovenians, and at the end by EU Austrians. In Bulgaria, freshly admitted to the EU, the young border guard winked at me when I showed him my German passport. He smiled and said, a Turkish lady with a German passport. He savored the sounds of our first names as he pronounced them. Karl Sevgi. I think he was happy that Bulgaria belongs to the EU and that now he was meeting his European friends on this old train. How lovely, I thought, how lovely that the Bulgarians aren't mad at the Turks anymore for the Ottoman occupation, which had lasted for centuries. Now the Bulgarians are in the EU and the Turks are still begging to get in. That's some small comfort, you have to grant them that. Years ago, for the same reason, I had been happy for the Greeks when they got into the EU." End quote. <laughs> the affective tenor of EU references here tends to be light and witty in contrast to the intense longing of singing workers and the profound sorrow of grieving parents and children. That the teleological trajectories of both labor migration and EU expansion in On the Train narratively activate an affective presumption of temporal continuity from past to future, even if that continuity takes the form of loss. While Ustamar's original title for her German text was Bahnfahrt, the train ride, as she reports, Die Zeit insisted on publishing it under the heading Leben im Dazwischen, or living in the in-between space, 
which the author vehemently rejected in 2014 for purposes of English translation in favor of imzug or on the train. Imzug can also mean in the draft, though, and it is to the drafty scenes of translation of narration that I now turn to explain how Özdemar's on the train undermines any presumption of temporal continuity in favor of narrative activation of future affects instead. The text overriding macro narratives of transnational labor migration and Europeanization from above in the form of the EU are accompanied on the train by a persistent micro motif of pesky mosquitoes. These irritants, which will not leave the train even when beleaguered passengers create a powerful draft to rid themselves of them by opening opposing windows when the train is in motion, signal a kind of miniaturized Europeanization, I'm sorry, miniaturized Europeanization from below, underlying even that Europeanization from below represented by the working songsters of labor migration. The text narrative rendition of these traveling mosquitoes both mimics the story's macro narrative of EU expansion in amusing ways and indicates that the mosquitoes are there to disturb any sense of temporal, narrative, or figural continuity in orientation. When we first encounter the mosquitoes on the train, we read, quote, since the train hadn't stopped at any station during the night, I didn't know whether we were still in not EU Serbia or already in Croatia, which is going to belong to the EU very soon. But I didn't care where we were, soon to be Europe, Croatia, or not Europe, Serbia. A mosquito had woken me up and was biting my legs, end quote. The narrator launches into witty reflections on whether the mosquitoes will ever be able to travel back to their original points of departure and on how the mixed blood of these internationally minded mosquitoes might be properly categorized since they effectively combine, quote, Europe and not Europe in their blood, end quote. Ultimately, the narrator pokes fun at herself, though, for, quote, becoming a blood expert on this train, end quote. More precisely, the narrative voice pokes fun at or unsettles the narrative figure of herself in pre-scripted relation to discourses of Europeanization. This links her in important ways to the mosquitoes as a figure of narration. For when she goes into the washroom, she discovers a cracked mirror and a mosquito flying in front of it. As we then read, the narrating persona, quote, saw the mosquito doubled in the mirror and killed it, leaving a, splot, a spot of blood behind, end quote. While we might interpret this scene to mean that the eye of the tail simply kills the irritating insect as such, I suggest that Uzdema is doing much more than this since her narrator kills the very image of the mosquito that is to say its mimetic double in representation. This suggests in turn that the figure of the mosquitoes on the train is itself an indexical decoy for something else on the move in Uzdema's thinking narration as I shall show. The primary affect associated with Özdemar's mosquitoes is that of intense irritation tied to deictic disorientation too. But the thematic emphasis on affective motifs shifts at one juncture from humans to landscapes outside the train, which the narrator's traveling companion wishes to paint as if they were living creatures. This again conjures the image of representation and the motifs of death and loss are close at hand when we read paratactically, quote, the cemeteries, the gravestones, end quote. This could of course suggest a broken temporal relationship to the past waiting to be <coughs> narratively restored. However, I would argue instead that we should pay keener attention to the narrator's assertion that, quote, what we were seeing from the window of the train was telling us something, end quote, and further that the text's own telling of that something stresses a broken relationship to the future of that telling rather than to the past. An irritating mosquito plays an important role here too as an indexical figure of narration. 
While the train is standing still and other passengers are sleeping, the narrator steps into the lonely aisle, hears a mosquito buzzing her, quote, loud as a dive bomber, end quote, a bit of sonic imagination here too, and experiences a sudden temporal shift in thought. What follows is a linear account of gendered atrocities in the context of the Balkan Wars of the early 90s. Quote, I slapped at my ear, at my face, hoping to hit it, meaning the mosquito. Uh, I heart, hurt myself and suddenly thought of Zafia, a woman from Yugoslavia who was now living in Berlin and working as a cleaning woman. When Yugoslavia still existed, Zafia was living in Sarajevo and working as a teacher. Then the war broke out. One morning, she was sitting at the table with her husband and her brother. While they were having breakfast, the Serbian militia suddenly came into the house, killed her husband and her brother before her eyes, and dragged her along with other women in a truck to a camp. Men there raped Zafia and the other women for two days. Zafia lost consciousness. When she came to again, the first thing she did was to reach for her hair, her long braid, which reached to her thighs. It was gone, cut off. Zafia's first thought was, where is my braid? She didn't ask herself where her husband or her brother was. She asked, where is my braid? The German Red Cross brought Zafia to Berlin, end quote. The mosquito as indexical narrative irritant was only a means to get us here, I would say, and in this sense the Turkish persona who narrates on the train could be read as a kind of secondary witness in Elida Asman's terminology or a co-witness in Irene Kikandis's narratological terminology, except that Özdemar's narrator neither sees the reported events nor hears anyone reporting them. All she hears is a mosquito buzzing her ear like a dive bomber at a sudden shift in the relationship between past and future that she experiences in Arendtian terms as a battlefield and not a home. The story she is there to tell is not Zafia's in any proper sense but her own and this telling proceeds in emphatically paratactic terms of indeterminate reference. Quote, the braid, a braid, a woman's braid, many men, a knife, a knight like this one here. The braid was lying somewhere, but where, end quote. Despite repeated stresses on the where of things in this passage, the narrator's core social dilemma is how to parse the temporality of future telling in relation to past events. This is why she both likens the night of Zafia's rape to, quote, this night here, end quote, and also apostrophically addresses the night, literally, as a temporal structure that is an open question in what Arendt would call the very heart of time. Quote, what can I ask of you with your stars, which have their fixed place every night, and the moon, which also has its fixed place? How shall I ask you where Zafia's braid is?" End quote. The question as to how to ask the question is not merely a question that could be answered by filling in gaps in knowledge about the past, for it is also, in Arendtian terms, an open political question about the authorization of futurity in other Europe's and 21st century literatures of transformation. Özdemar's narrative irritation of future affects in On the Train thus goes beyond isomorphic precepts of intercultural analysis in the 1980s and 1990s and beyond the more differentiated heteromorphic models of inter- and transcultural critique that have since displaced them. Yet Özdemar's narrative irritation of future affects also pushes us to go beyond key heteromorphic insights of transcultural memory studies, such as those generated by Michael Rothberg's seminal study of multidirectional memory in the entanglements of post-colonial studies and Holocaust studies, for example. For Özdemar's on the train questions not only the future of memory, 
but the temporal structure of the futurity of European futures too. Thank you very much. fascinating uh, presentations um, on the theme of migration, but obviously um, showing us how rich the theme of migration and how diverse uh, discussing uh, migration uh, could be. So, um, and I hope something nevertheless will come out of the um, discussing these papers uh, together. Um, and one thing that, uh, before opening up uh, it to the uh, audience for questions, one thing that um, interested me, um, th listening to uh, the three presentations together, uh, beyond their individual uh, contributions, uh, was something that, uh, Leslie, you had um, done in your previous work. I mean, in a way, you, your previous work is committed uh, to a new vocabulary to discuss migration and to the construction of a new vocabulary, new tropes mm -hmm. to discuss migration in order to go beyond the stereotypes that are usually used, which in a way perpetuate the problems and um, uh, perpetuate the discrimination and so on. So, so in that sense, I felt that in these two talks, in Martin's and Pamela's talks, uh, the, um, the fact that the garden and the voice uh, appeared as uh, new tropes to discuss migrant experience was something uh, that we might uh, we might um, think a little bit more. Um, uh, Martin, you um, you use garden as an analogy uh, for the identity of the migrant in uh, two senses, both uh, as uh, to reflect on the need for constant cultivation, constant growing, and so on and so forth. And but also uh, I. I thought that the moment in your uh, talk where you talked about the garden with migrant seeds uh, was an interesting metaphor to demystify this idea of nature as an unchanging essential character. I mean, you, in a way, garden, you use garden as a way to demystify the naturalization of nature. Uh, and I felt that the garden as a trope to discuss migration um, would, um, would be in line, perhaps, with Le Leslie's um, Project, project about uh, the commitment to a new vocabulary. And uh, in terms of the appearance of the voice, I mean, voice is both a very familiar and a very unfamiliar trope. In a way, uh, when we th think about um, the trope of can the subaltern uh, speak, can the oppressed have a voice? So voice is actually a very familiar um, metaphor, but it's a very unfamiliar metaphor in the art scene. So maybe that's mm -hmm. why uh, it works so well. Um, both as a defamiliarizing uh, or a new trope, but at the same time a, a very relatable uh, trope <coughs> to discuss migration. So, so um, yeah, listening the, to these three talks uh, together made me think of um, yeah finding new tropes to discuss migration to go beyond uh, the perpetuation of stereotypes uh, and so on. So I was wondering if uh, you have anything to say about each other's <laughs> talk in that sense. Um, I, I do. Um, I, 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 I love both, both of your talks and I think in, in keeping with, with Ezra's rem remarks, one of the things that really struck me was the degree to which all three papers um, uh, focused on certain kinds of aesthetic perspectives. And um, uh, I was thinking of the, the one place in, in your talk where you said um, that Marxism could be useful because the migrants in so many places are uh, um, the most disenfranchised. Uh, and at that point, I, I started thinking, well, what, ele what specific elements of Marx are useful? And I recalled a, a book by Jody Dean, who is a political, very smart political theorists uh, from this area who wrote a book called The Communist Horizon, uh, 
where she argues for the continued viability of um, uh, communist politics specifically, but specifically for her in terms of class struggle, and she says explicitly, not this aesthetic stuff. You know, the uh, aesthetics are no use to us politically, which I think is radically wrong. Um, uh, so uh, I was very intrigued by what you actually did with aesthetics, and then you with your emphasis on synesthesia too, which was a very sophisticated, subtle analysis. So I'm just, in, I, would I would love to hear more about um, um, sort of how you see the, the valence of, of the, the, the capability of aesthetic work to recraft either political categories or political projects um, or even the cognition of migration. Um, I guess I could, oh, I guess I could, uh, is, it is it on? Yeah, yeah, it looks like it's on. Okay. Um, I guess I could speak a little bit to what you said about metaphors. And um, the metaphor of voice is a very familiar one in post-colonial theory in particular. Um, but it's also a familiar metaphor in contemporary art discourse, particularly after the 1990s when contemporary art um, experienced a so-called so global turn and really borrowed from discourses of post-colonial studies to um, really frame and draw attention to the works of um, artists that were once invisible, you know, outside the Euro-American canon. But the problem was that it kind of over-framed these artists mm -hmm. through the metaphors of diaspora, migration, the in-between space, the nomad, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's been an issue, a kind of overburdening of metaphorical representation that a lot of these artists have struggled against and resisted. So I think what I was trying to do was to um, take voice and acknowledge that metaphoric capacity, but uh, give it more substance through consideration of aesthetics, you know, really sort of grounded in formal consideration of the works, which is what the artists want. They want, you know, a, the work to be the center of attention more so than, you know, these sort of metaphors of subjectivity that have gained real currency in the contemporary art world. Um, so for me, that's where this consideration of aesthetics um, sort of supports the analysis. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's very fructifying. It's like a lot of thinking. <laughs> now, I don't know if I'm clever enough to, um, to, get, to, to get out anything, but, but I, um, well, I love Hannah Arendt. I mean, I don't know, it's like, for me, she's one of the most important figures uh, in, in, in uh, um, yeah, maybe, and I love, and I didn't know that text, this idea of the heart of time, no? I mean, this has a lot to do with the momentum of aesthetics, I would say, no? This moment where you stop, when, where you are, on, where you are not belonging to anything, you just have this momentum of being kind of, and also to stillness, no? Then, and, and everything's still, you don't hear anything anymore, and, 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 and you are at the heart of time, then you know that you are, that you met this text that is perfect, like Adorno said, that has everything, and it's one sentence that it says everything that is necessary to say. So the search for this heart of time, I think that's a, a, a very human and, uh, and, and a mankind um, thing that is very essential and that has to do with our intelligence, culture, but also with our need for sensuality that, uh, that is so, so immediate. And the other thing that I think is important about Hannah Arendt is that she, uh, uh, as a figure, uh, could make herself as independent from from uh, from being a victim, you know. She uh, she and, and you, you you said that a little bit too. She being Jewish and being Jewish maybe being this kind of being forever and ever an immigrant and never really belonging. You no, know? this kind of being in zug, being being in between, uh, as a definition of a way of life as well. The question is is belonging anyway a desirable status. No, or is not this being in the in the train actually constantly in the train? Isn't that much more uh, uh, how we experience our life uh, anyway? And how to uh, how to define this 
this status much more than than the arriving uh, if there isn't any. So um, and maybe and then the other association I had, you know, Hannah Arendt always and, and the interviews with her are fascinating. I think she was a great writer, but she was a much better speaker than she was a writer. <laughs> so speaking of language, mm -hmm. the interviews with her, she constantly smoking and uh, and making all these faces and, and 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 being an actor actually being a total stage uh, uh, person are totally fascinating. How speaking is actually itself uh, uh, being in the train, being in this kind of uh, heart of time something that evolves but also immediately dissolves after you have said it. So, so, um, so these were my, my associations. <laughs> um, maybe I have one question individual for individuals for Martin and then we may open it up to um, the audience. Uh, I was curious, uh, it's really curiosity, uh, do you go back uh, to the um, project um, park mm -hmm. uh, and observe how it is used? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, if we continue with uh, this garden <laughs> metaphor, do you um, look at how the seeds <laughs> grow, and or does it matter for you, or mm -hmm. do you think yeah. that you, as a landscape architect, yeah. your um, you know you sh you should leave the stage and um, well, it's a it's a let's say I had the same question yesterday, by the way, in my, in my if I if I do evaluations afterwards of the like so, sociological if the stuff we propose it works in the end, I must say I don't care at all because for me again I think that is uh, uh, the motivation to, uh, and the conviction to do these kind of things is also to a certain extent irrelevant to their results. You know, it's this kind of aiming for for the impossible and trying to do your best independently of actually a, a, a recognizable or, or, or a justifiable outcome. I think that's also very, very important to have that in mind when you, when you, when you think of, of, of uh, let's say, st um, aesthetic strategies, uh, let's say, that, that, that actually try to meet this, this, this momentum, this uh, hats that side or the hats <laughs> in that side, I don't know, this uh, heart in time. No? So, um, obviously, one part of me cares, it's obvious, but I think, in the, but in reality, and I go often also to the projects, and I get, I also get feedback because it's impossible to be independent of that. But uh, I wouldn't say that this is in any way uh, objective or, or 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 something where I can uh, I can judge. So what I do, or what is what I think is like um, one way of seeing it is, and this is also maybe a little bit of this fantasy of of the gardeners that you kind of. Let's say, you know, if you have a river or whatever and you suddenly place a stone in a certain way, you make the stream change a little bit the direction, you know. So it's always this kind of manipulating, manipulating of time, you know, manipulating of, of nature so that in the end you are, uh, you are just uh, turning a little, tuning certain things, certain forces. And that's how I, see, uh, how I see what we do. So in the end, after the turning for me, I see the result, it's nice and that's it. Any questions from the audience? I have a follow-up question on the aesthetics. That uh, I think in all three paper presents work with having aesthetics of either with cynical characteristics or of cynical cynical aesthetics, if mm -hmm. I can say so. Yeah. And if you would agree, what would you think that if we consider the cynic has a more ambiguous political standpoint, if he has any? How it would work with all these migrancies and in, in artwork, migrancies in artwork. But humor is a good is a good uh, method. I think that that actually it's a kind of a shortcut of aesthetics into you know when you when you understand something, but you also can feel it. You know, I think that's also what gardens. or for me, what gardens often is about that you are in a space, but you feel that it's cold or warm or moisture or whatever. You know, so and. Uh, and, and I think humor is a little bit like that as well. It's a momentum in which you understand something, but you actually understand the opposite of it. So you get the whole the whole story. Instead of doing it right, you know, the Puranistic the Puranistic way of having a one directional thinking without any without rounding it up. So I think that cynicism uh, and the ambiguity uh, that it contains is a very good transport of the ambiguity of, of identity. And of the uh, yeah, the, and also the ridiculity of, of of the strict and and straight, you know, because that's what we laugh about in the end. You know? So I think that uh, cynicism is a good uh, is uh, is positive. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I would, I would agree. I feel like my, my answer would kind of echo yours and cynicism in the guise of parody in particular in the way that artists are very strategic and, and how they calibrate parody in the work. Sort of, um, you know, they're very, very, they're very strategic about the handling of excess. Um, so yeah, you know, also in a way that allows for am the ambiguity is always deliberate. You know, uh, like Erica Tan, for example, she wants that obscurity to be there about, you know, who is she really talking about? Is she really talking about Halima, or is she talking about herself? She wants that question to always be there. Also the view from outside, no, sorry, but that always this humor is often transported and a certain cynicism is often transported by, by minorities, you know? Germany losing the Jews lost also totally the, the humor, the, the few, the little humor they had, you know, got lost as well with the Holocaust among, among other things. So it's often also the minorities <coughs> who have this kind of inside and outside view that are also capable of, of getting this kind of ambiguity and naming it and, 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 and testing, let's say, testing the grounds. So I think it's a, it's a, it is a, a, a possible methodology. You know? So you equate Sorry. humor with cynicism? No, I don't. Yeah. You don't. I didn't. No, no, but that's how I would... Cynicism is being, is being seen critically because it sounds like, uh, uh, I don't know, that you don't... Uh, well, what does it mean in the end? That you, do, that you say something you don't really mean or that it's like that you give up on believing and are just cynical about anything, so who cares? To a certain extent, I think it's a healthy position to be a, a bit cynical and not, and not be... Uh, conviction for one or the other thing always creates also a certain danger, you know? And it's also kind of inhuman, this kind of being right. So it, I am right, so that's the reason I, I vote for Trump, you know? So it's good to be a bit cynical. So, um, I think it's a really interesting question. I don't think I would consider the narrator of this story cynical. No, and there's uh, nothing ambiguous about the, um, you know, the idea that what happened in the Balkan Wars was horrific or, or that the grief of the Turkish fathers is... Um, is real. Um, there are elements of parody, that the for mosquito. sure. Um, the mosquito. Um, uh, but I, as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of um, uh, Peter Sloterdijk's first book, which was the critique of cynical reason. Mm -hmm. And what he put forward, I think that's actually his, his best book. I don't particularly <laughs> like the things he's done mm. more recently. But um, uh, he put forward the idea of kinical, not cynical, but kinical reason, which is a kind of, and I can't reconstruct the entire argument, but it's a kind of embodied uh, critique of modern reason. And his argument there is that uh, modern reason in the Western world has itself become cynical and therefore not really an effective um, vehicle for critique. So if I were going to try to link the Erzdema story to discourses of cynicism, I would probably go for the kinical because the, um, uh, the, um, the serious and the humorous moments of that story are all tied to very physical, almost palpably physical things. The mosquito biting um, her legs, um, uh, everybody crying or, or singing. Um, there's a lot of physical materiality there. Um, so that would be my answer to that Thank question. You. Thank you. Sabine, and then there are um, I'm not sure if that's a way of sort of thinking about um, the presentation together, but I really appreciate in a way, I, I was wondering about access um, to particular kinds of, sort of spaces across the papers, but one thing I really appreciate with the sort of aesthetics questions is that aesthetics carries across um, class lines, right, with sort of the, the, the very public park um, at the beginning to sort of the Zeit um, or something else. But it sort of made me wonder in terms of sort of what kinds of, that you would want to talk across, sort of what kinds of spaces make the kind of things you're interested in possible 
Um, this may all sound very weak, so I cannot get away from Liz's presentation and sort of thinking like, oh, this one was definitely not high-speed trains. <laughs> I think that seems sort of important and sort of how they move through this extended border zone in, in South, um, um, Southeastern Europe. Um, but it also makes me wonder about the specificity of Copenhagen, right, as, as sort of just northern um, um, and, 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 and sort of the the question of the art gallery, or sort of where is that art located, and how is it getting accessed, and by whom? Uh, th the beginning of the question was just sort of like Martin's audience is quite clearly quite different, right? Because it's migrant, whereas sort of the audience of the other two presentations are much more clearly a a addressing sort of the the, the resident population um, that hasn't necessarily migrated. Um, I'm I said we can't do something that make no sense whatsoever. That's how I read your faces right now, which is why I don't think it's But but it sort of makes me wonder about sort of the network of, of types of spaces um, that that sustain you know, that are very specific, each one in them, right? That also clearly speak to each other in sort of a, a, a certain kind of typology of porousness. But I think the narrative gets them to, when you said that Adorno felt at home in a text, you know, for me, what we do is also extremely narrative. I mean, the stories around the things is what makes the space also, you know, because you, so you need the text to be at home. So in the end, that's, uh, it's in the end, it's very similar. I think it's very similar. We all live in some kind, or also the work that you showed about the rise, about the, the stories that, you know, the fetish of things from your past and then you translate into something new because you have a new profession, you live in a new country, you whatever, you have the rice still be there and, and the neon, whatever, just transformed, translated into a new into a new, new state of being. A language is something that you take with you, you know, speaking of a, of a Jewish um, idea and thinking of the people of the book that actually do not need a place because they have the idea, they have God and they have the text. Uh, to read from, you know, and, and if you think of the immigrants, if you think of Zweig, of, of Adorno, of whoever, uh, how, how important it was for them to have the language with them and to feel at home in the sound of the language, uh, etc. So I think that this is uh, important to understand that the, that the borders that have been uh, uh, put to rationalize and to justify certain uh, ways of doing things, and I think also the question of cynicism is similar, is trying to just uh, put certain things in a box you know, instead of understanding that the, 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 the relations between uh, typologies, between fields, between ideas is incredibly fluent, much more fluent than we, that we sometimes also like. Can I say something? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. uh, question just, what occurred to me about uh, the Ozdemo story is, um, Un unlike many of her other writings, which are situated in major European cities, even if a character travels um, between or among them, this story is really situated on the train that's moving mm, through yeah. these different spaces. But the, the Europe that the train is moving through doesn't exist yet in a way. I mean, there, mm. there is this emphasis on soon to be, um, this anticipatory um, uh, a sense of an anticipatory space. Um, and I was relating that uh, in, in my mind to, to Martin's comment about building ideas. <coughs> I think that's a very intriguing uh, way of um, phrasing it or thinking about what, what is the materiality of building ideas for things that don't exist yet. Mm -hmm. And, and um, there's probably a, a connection there to the kind of materiality that, um, or the materiality of the sonic imagination that you were um, uh, presenting. So that's what I would think about in terms of space. Um, I thought the, uh, the the English garden and the, the borough garden was a really interesting um, analogy to the, to the identity and construction of nationalism. I was wondering if you comment on German allotment gardens mm -hmm. in Berlin and mm -hmm. maybe how they have their rules and their kind of organization, yeah. but also 
the relationship they have with community gardens now and how that's really taking these immigrant issues um, and directly spatializing them with different practices and engagement. I must say I have little experience on, on, on those things. I haven't thought how, what kind of, of uh, I mean, they are a very German thing to start with. <laughs> <laughs> there is no more, there is no space with more order, you know, the, the rules in these allotment gardens, how high the hedge has to be and uh, what kind of color your chair has to be and everything is like, <laughs> it's like little concentration camps. No? But, um, however, obviously they also have a social fascination and they, and, um, and all these stories of the, of the community gardens. Um, I'm a little bit critical but I don't know if it's right that I am. But um, well, I don't. I don't like to be cheated somehow, you know. Uh, or let's put it like I like to be cheated if I know that I'm getting cheated, and I do it on purpose. You know, I go to a cinema because I, I want to get cheated. I read a book because I want to get into a fantasy world, you know. But I don't like when things get kind of that they sold them to me for reality, but actually they aren't. And this is maybe one of the biggest dangers of the garden because the garden is kind of. It, it, it has this ambiguity of being ultra real, but also at the same time totally abstract and, and, and a fantasy world. So, and um, in terms of these community gardens, I think that uh, what I do not like about them, uh, I, I, I totally believe in, in, in the state, so I'm German, and, uh, and I do believe in those terms in the public space. Okay, and the public space may, means, as there was this question before, for whom the park is. Uh, and the park in Copenhagen is not is for the community who lives there, but obviously it's also for the people who go there to see it because it became also an incredible attraction. So the people from the whole city go there. And I was telling yesterday, it's like uh, it's becoming uh, because of its resonance, it's the tenth most visited touristic site of Denmark now. <laughs> you know, so that not only people from Denmark go there, but from around the world. So in the end, it is uh, it is uh, uh, it is for everyone. However, I think that it's not good to privatize problems, okay? In my opinion, it doesn't have to be right or wrong, but I think it's good to have public spaces in which, let's say, everyone is welcome, and also you don't have to do something to belong, you know? It's a little bit Puritan, I think, that you have to work to belong, you know, to, have to make grow things, etc. But, it, but it's really on a, on a thoughtful way. I think in an everyday life way, I think uh, these places have to be judged one by one, maybe. So uh, I think that the, st that the state has the responsibility to offer public spaces in where we can have this kind of encounters between really different people and not just the same people. Because in the end, in these allotment gardens or also in these community gardens, in the end, it's not the community, it's some kind of, it's just Asians or just blacks or just whatever, you know? So there is no encounter actually, really. So it's also a kind of a little concentration camp, you know? Just a nice one. There was a question, um, I had a question. So I found the, uh, as someone who uh, studied in Germany for a long time, and also someone who has uh, Yugoslav heritage, um, I found the Erskman story very interesting because it's symptomatic, I think, of a trend I've observed in German literature, but particularly German media, in like focusing on, um, on a fascination with the Yugoslav conflict, with the war in Poland, mm -hmm. and uh, particularly on a sort of tendency to demonize Serbia. And I think it's interesting because, well, the question is, how do you think that um, Germans in particular, but, but Europeans in general, having uh, very troubled pasts in terms of colonialism and war and genocide? Um, deal with immigrants who are from other parts of the world that have trouble histories? That's a good question. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Uh, I think that the, you know, on the one hand, you have the very sort of entrenched, almost fierce kind of position uh, on the part of the German state and the German public that uh, immigrants, uh, you know, they have to learn German, they have to uh, um, accept the basic uh, democratic order of, of 
the state, which is also a, uh, a product of the Germans' attempts to come to terms with their own criminal past. Um, uh, I don't think there is, um, I don't, I don't think there's a very effective public discourse for uh, dealing with uh, kind of entangled transnational questions of um, um, so other sort of genocides or um, uh, criminal histories. I mean, there's a lot of newer debate now about the German contemporary response to the genocide of Herero and Nama in um, German Southwest Africa in the early part of the, the 20th century. Um, um, and there is a strong legacy of victim perpetrator discourses that can that easily get very um, dichotomized um, and. Uh, and the victim yeah. becomes the synonym of the good, even though there is nothing yes. necessarily yeah. that ties the victim. It's not a good answer to your question, but that's the best I have at the moment. You had a question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I really appreciated all three of the papers, and I was struck in a way by this idea that to speak about migration, you have to almost find a new language in which to do that. And I was struck by how all of you really wove webs. You were all spiders, in a way. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I'm struck by how that creates the, that very kind of gap or oscillation. There's a lot of oscillation in the ways that you presented, whether it's Martin, you did it with humor and a certain kind of positioning that allowed us to take in your projects uh, in a way that kept us uh, kept us in motion. And I think for Pamela, beautifully, I mean, the Halima Sinti uh, imagery was like this spider spinning up its cocoon while its language was, was um, so effective in creating that sense of proxy, that sense of our, who are we, right? And I think the same with this idea of the witness or the secondary witness. So I guess my question for you I, I work on Southeast Asia, and I work on uh, sometimes 14th century poems, for example, that are all about writing in this very way and creating webs. It's just that the Dutch during the colonial period didn't think it was good writing. And it, but these texts were all about migration and about the coming together of a rich cosmopolitan mix of things, which I feel is there in all of your writing. So I guess my question is, do we need a new language? Or do we just need to uh, um, resist the academic frameworks in which we have been, in a sense, encased by spiders in the web and break free from that and write in the ways that you're all writing or presenting, which are more uh, in motion, uh, freely oscillating between things? So I guess that's my question. Is it new or is it not? Is it just that we are reframing it? Can it be both? Well, I think we can. <laughs> I, I guess my question is, I'm wondering if, if we need to, to reinvent it. It could be that we just need to turn and look at it in a new way, which I think I applaud you all because I think you're all doing that. Right? I mean, I, I felt the emotion for all three of the presentations. They were very engaging in a, very, in a different way from what I have usually experienced. So I think the very methods we're using are creating this migration effect. So I applaud you for that. Yes. Um, are you Thank you. Oh, you have something? I don't know, maybe we want to respond yeah, to that. Yeah, I mean, just, um, yeah, I, th I think you, you articulated sort of the quandary that I'm dealing with in talking about voice, where I'm struggling not to get trapped in discourse. Mm -hmm the predominant way of thinking about voice. Again, trying to get back to the raw materiality of voice. How do I do that? Um, and, you know, 
I, I took a lot from being your student and <laughs> trying to balance that discursive sort of support with, um, you know, trying, you try to make people see what you see through language. Your language is our recourse of making others see or hear what we, what we see or hear or feel. Um, whether, whether it be through a kind of ekphrastic writing or some kind of language that evokes the synesthetic, um, the poetic perhaps, but I feel like there's always that tension, that struggle is, is always there not to get swallowed up by language and, um, and writing, yeah, not to let the, the objects, the images get swallowed up by that, yeah. I think the sense of lost, no, that is part of this immigration idea, is not something that is uh, only immanent to immigrants. I mean, that's human. Sure. So I mean, that in that respect, maybe we need a new way to to frame or to 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 speak about it because it's not it's not the unusual immigration is not like the different and it happened to someone because they had war or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's it's a total human condition. I think that we that we face. Obviously, in all writings, you know, in, in every in every book, probably the sense of lost of whatever, you know, and um, and in that respect, probably every generation finds their own stories uh, and their and um, and their own narratives. So it's also interesting. I, I read, I, I was reading uh, Vatas, the the line that's in Vatas again. I had to read them at school, and obviously I hated them because it was in school. <laughs> And so I was reading it again, and then I, I thought, how, what a good book that is. And I was like surprised how, why I didn't find out before. But 20 years ago, I was a different person, seemingly, and the context was different and whatever. And, and the significance of the words that, that he suddenly is, is, is how he speaks about suicide, for example, how, he's, how Goethe speaks about education, how he is incredibly modern in, in so many respects. No? And you could read the book from, from today. So this sense in the end, that um, that yeah that the that the sense of time maybe the idea of the the, the good pieces of whatever kind if it's uh, architectural literature or or singing or voices or whatever or pieces of art they have this uh, kind of heart of time quality that they they feel uh, always valid mm -hmm. you know and they don't seem to they seem to almost fall out of time no they seem to be and this is also what the immigration of what the identity is it is not. It, it it doesn't need to have a, 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 a it doesn't need to be utilitarian. We are always looking for how things can be judged or or justified or measured or whatever. But in the end, if we look how how thoughtful uh, um, good narratives can be, for example, and how free of time they are. So I think this heart of time thing is a good could have been the title of the of the <laughs> of the of the of the event to, today, no? And that's what we I think that's important to aim for. And immigration is not I mean it's also fancy or let's say it's a modern time issue. Like every time has some kind of uh, fashions as social fashions as well if you want. You also could look at it from that perspective. So it's a human condition. Being an immigrant it's a it's a it's a way of life, let's say. It's it's deciding to go for a for a multi multiplicity in identity and not to have to decide if you are that or that, to, to allow yourself to change over time, to, re, to, to, to change your, uh, your opinions about yourself and about what you do, and to, uh, to be capable to reinvent yourself uh, in, in terms of your life and not having to have one belief, you know? Like the, the decision for the nation state was one language, one religion, one state, you know, and and this is the, and this is what leads what it leads also to fascism in the end in Europe. Before that, it was a total chaos, and everyone was fighting for with everyone. I don't th I don't know if it was much better, <laughs> but uh, but at least uh, it allowed us a much more diversity, a much more, um, you know, a, a, a figure like Kafka, for example, you know, he lived in Prague, he spoke Czech, he was Jewish, he wrote in German. You know, his girlfriend was Czech, so he needed to talk Czech to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there you see the multiplicity of lives he actually and of identities he had, and and it, and it wasn't unusual. It wasn't just him because he was crazy. It was a standard. So, and I think we are getting back to this kind of multiplicity in which we don't need to decide if we are one thing or another thing. When people ask me about my identity, I mostly say, in the mornings I'm mostly German. <laughs> 
you know. <laughs> so uh, you can decide by the by the, by the hour of the day what kind of nationality or or whatever. Uh, so I'm a very a morning active person, yeah. <laughs> but I turn more and more Latin towards the evening. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a lot of discussion of voice, narrative, uh, to some degree writing, but the emphasis has been there. But I think you opened the door when you were talking about the neon race field. Was that the mm -hmm. title of that you used? Mm -hmm. Into sound studies. If sound yeah. is differentiated from voice, yeah. for instance. Um, and there, so we have two questions, both brief. I didn't quite get the sonic aspect of your reading of the Ricefield's piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other question is more speculative, I guess. Um, could you think about a place for attention to the sonic as opposed to just the vocal? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe in part responding to conscience? Yeah. Kaya. Kaya, yeah. pardon me. Yes, okay. um, question about newness and whether or not sound studies has a potential for newness that we haven't seen before. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're very right. I mean, I'm really at the very beginning of this research, so I'm only just now delving into the sound studies literature. Um, but the yeah, there is an issue in contemporary art sort of theory and discourse in which, um, well, sound is making headway. Um, in terms of how it's being theorized in, in contemporary art, for sure. Voice, not so much. Um, and, um, sorry, I, I'll just I'll hop over to your first question about Neon Ricefield. Um, that one I'm, I'm using as an entry point, and there's ways in which I don't think I've articulated enough the sonic dimensions or the sonic imagination that I am arguing the work evokes. Um, because that also gets lost in the visual and the material and the other perceptual senses of the work. So those are kind of embedded. Um, but I don't think I would try to argue for its isolation, for the sonic, the sonic elements isolation from those elements because it can't be separated from the visual just as the visual can't be separated from the sonic or the olfactory. And so even, even a kind of, it, maybe it works through a chain of significa, uh, significations. Maybe the sonic is evoked by the imaging of the urban um, as metaphorized through neon. Um, because like the urban ruins, well, I call them urban ruins, these sort of ruins of urban modernism in Savannah Ket Laos there's a kind of temporality, a temporal imagination that works there too. I mean, one imagines these modernist structures in their heyday, perhaps in the 50s and 60s, and the kinds of sounds associated with a thriving sort of urban center, post-colonial center, but then to think about it as a ruin now situating it in the present, quietude, stillness, you know, it's basically, Savannah Kett's a, a ghost town these days. Um, so perhaps I needed to th articulate more the sonic imagination as it operated through a chain further down the line. Um, or perhaps, yeah, to temporally situate the I'm sonic imagination. I'm rice, because when you describe yeah. it, can you hear the rice cooking in the neon? That's what, I would, that was yeah, my sound. What, I, mean, so I yeah. think I've, I've, I've heard that, because I, I didn't get to see it in its installation. I was uh, too young. Um, <laughs> But there's also, for me, something about the scale of the work mm -hmm. that invokes, you know, you, you, for all of us who cook rice at home, you know, the sound when you <laughs> pour the rice into the pot, that, yeah, and then to magnify, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of magnify mm -hmm. that scale if you think of it being processed in a factory, in an American factory. Um, yeah, you see the sound, actually, no? There are certain yeah. things where you actually, with rice, Everyone knows how it sounds when you pour it, no? So it's, uh, yeah, that's interesting. So I think I, I uh, this is going to be developed into something longer, and for the sake of today, I really was 
sort of greedy and wanted to get as many, uh, create as much of a synesthetic web as I could. Mm -hmm. And I think within that web, the, the sonic imagination that I was trying to pull out got a little bit lost. Yeah. Any other questions? I had one. Okay. Like... <laughs> no, I think we have one. Time for one more. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And my question will be to Professor um, uh, Leslie. <laughs> Leslie Evanson. Um, so the, the motif of the train and the mosquito is very interesting. And it's obviously brought um, Andrzej Asimov to my mind, who writes about Marcel Prost. And, is the author of Out of Egypt, then obviously he became very famous with this movie, Call Me By Your Name. Um, and there, um, they use the motif of the mosquito as, um, as a signer or like a, a warner of disease, something contagious, something dirty, or because it um, um, touches upon the idea of the queer love, etc. Uh, so I wonder, I mean, although this hopeful idea of translation and movement and the mosquito having multiple bloods in itself is, is very nice, I wonder if there's um, something in um, in Inese Gersdomar's um, books that, you know, that talk about this idea of um, discrimination or like the migrant has a disease or, you know, the migrant that's, you know, that's someone who carries something, you know, bad into Europe or, you know, does she ever talk about, or does she have this, you know, dark side of um, uh, of being a migrant in Europe, or is it is it more of a hopeful motif that that comes with the idea of translation? I, I don't think. I mean, it's a very interesting question. I don't I don't recall ever encountering the motif of contagion, so physical contagion in in her work. Um, there, there are dark sides, though, for sure, that um, mostly have to do with grief, um, both of a personal nature, but also um, political forms of grief regarding uh, sort of Turkish oppression by the state or the military against leftists in the 1970s and. Um, deaths and, and um, traumatic experiences uh, experienced in imprisonment there, or uh, the ghost of the Armenian genocide. So it's 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 definitely not all you know witty, fluffy, um, happy stuff. Um, but n nonetheless, a lot of her writing, even those that have that darker side, also. Um, have a certain kind of, this is going to sound strange given what I just said, but there, there are elements of, of humor or um, that usually have to do with um, some kind of aesthetic transformation, mm -hmm. um, a, a reworking in aesthetic terms that then always has some kind of political and, and historical stakes to it. There's one more question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I have. There was this great continuity between Pamela's uh, talk and Professor Edelson's, and I just wanted to ask um, to the panel in general uh, how you feel. So, Pamela uh, said something about uh, speaking for and speaking as, and I kind of sat here uh, thinking about it and I was like speaking with, speaking to, speaking at. And, but there's, a, there's an ethical aspect to this and I think uh, both of you got to that in a, in a particular way and I wonder, it's not necessarily the artist or the writer in, in the case of any mistake, it was the one it's the narrator, but I wonder how the narrator or the artist necessarily engages ethically with the voicing uh, of a positionality, you know, um, not necessarily talking as the um, disenfranchised, but uh, in some kind of removed position, in some kind of disembodied uh, oral sense. 
Um, it was very interesting that you both kind of went there, <coughs> you with the, the video that you showed, and, and with the mosquito. So I kind of wondered if you wanted to say anything about the ethical aspect of that. <coughs> Um, I think, you know, for Erica Tan and a lot of artists, um, you know, I, you know very well, I'm sure, Hal Foster's essay, right, <laughs> um, on the archival impulse and how it, it, it is predicated around a kind of indeterminacy of historical recovery and historical questions that, you know, the artist will never take responsibility as a historian or a sociologist in a way that I think resonates with what Martin said about, you know, you don't feel like you have this responsibility to go back to the park and like do a survey of, you know, how many people are using it and they don't, they don't see themselves as having to sort of quantify in rational or ethical terms, a kind of sociological project. You know, they put creativity at the heart of what they do. And um, I mean, sometimes it's a mode of deflection, right? I'm an artist, I'm not a historian, I'm not an ethnographer, so I have this space of, you know, to work with um, in which these questions of representation um, can be a little murky, right? Um, but uh, I lost my train of thought. But I'm not sure, maybe I was going in the direction. Was I going in the direction you were kind of asking? Or, I mean, know. honestly, this is a question I pose to you, and yeah. that I, I have conversations with the artists that I work on, uh, in that I feel they're very considerate of the ethical aspect, and, and they always worry about it, I feel. Um, so I, I just wanted to get a sense of how you thought that. I think that she, she is concerned about it, but she knows that she can sidestep it because she can always suspend the figure of Halima in a space of spectrality. You know, she can rely on the fact that the archival materials are so scarce that Halima will never be a concrete historical figure and she can play with that, you know. Yeah. So... I wouldn't say that Erzdemar uh, is um, so a couple of things. One is um, critics often make the mistake of assuming that the voice of Erzdemar's narrator is strictly autobiographical. Um, uh, because many of her own experiences are in fact reflected or reworked in these fictional texts, but uh, I would still say it's, it's a fictive voice, but when, when critics and readers assume the autobiographical component, that they assume that she speaks for Turkish migrant experience, because she herself um, went to Germany around the age of 17 as a Turkish guest worker and worked as a laborer um, for a couple of years and then went back to Turkey and got um, uh, professional training as an actor uh, and, uh, and then she went back to uh, Germany and was very active uh, in theater and, and film and, and, and many of those motifs are also reflected in these in these texts. But if one does sort of close readings of her literary style and, and, the, and the role that voice plays there, um, I wouldn't say it's a style that claims to speak for certain sort of easily categorizable subject positions. And, and maybe the, the best example is um, sort of the way that the Armenian genocide figures in, in uh, some of her writing. So there's never a claim to write, say, for um, either the Armenian diaspora or the uh, Armenian um, uh, victims. But there is a way that the, the subject position of the narrator 
which has many um, uh, filaments into, into many different webs of historical experience, uh, feels accountable to those histories and others as well, but not in the way of I'm now going to speak for this story or tell the story or um, and there is a way in which the sort of the individual voice is fundamentally social without being uniformly collective in any way. Mm -hmm. so I think that's an important distinction for Would you say right? commitments to ethics without the side act Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> um, so well it's late and I know everyone is Hungry. We have a reception. Uh, so thank you very much for these wonderful uh, presentations and papers, and also for the discussion, for your commitment to um, the uh, discussion. And thank you for your questions. And it has been, a, I think, a very uh, memorable panel. <laughs> thank you. Very much.